In the city of Oz lived a man named Job, a great man who loved God and lived good. He had seven sons and three daughters and was very rich. Unfortunately, this man who did no one no evil lived on this evil planet. So what happened? Evil eventually pounced on him. He lost everyone and everything, including his health. This well-respected man became a joke and a cuss word. Those who thought he was better off dead than alive advised him to curse God so God will get upset and end his life. But guess what Job said? Though he slays me, yet I will trust him. How did a man like Job come to such an expensive conclusion? Another fellow named Habakkuk went through a very rough time and came up with his own conclusion. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olives may fail and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet and he will make me walk on my high heels. Habakkuk 3, 17 to 19. Daniel and some of the Israelites lived as good as they should despite the evil others around them were drowning in. And what happens? The good and the bad were all violently uprooted from their homes and moved to another country whose faith and culture were so different from theirs. Daniel and his friends did not hold it against God that he was silent when they were taken into captivity. They did not hold it against God that the king who was feeling like God was dictating who and how they worshipped. Daniel was minding his business when his colleagues conspired to get rid of him. The king at the time decreed that no other god be worshipped. Guess what Daniel did? He opened his windows and without hiding continued to worship the same god that was silent as they were taken into captivity. Why would a wise man like Daniel continue to believe in the God that let them down by allowing them to become slaves in no man's land? Daniel was blameless on the job. He did no wrong to anyone and he ended up in the lion's den because of his faith in this same God that seemed to have failed him and his people. These three guys who watched as God did nothing while they were taken into captivity who waited every year, hoping this will be the year they'll finally get to go back home. And it never happened. Made a dangerous choice that day to continue to believe in this same God that doesn't seem to have done them any good at all. They chose to defy the king that desecrate their faith. And here was their conclusion. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Daniel 3, 16-18 why will these three smart guys throw their lives away by choosing to defy a formidable king rather than give up an invisible God? Even Jesus, God's own favored son, got to that junction where God makes no sense. And there he cried, my father, my father, why have you forsaken me? He died for sins he never committed, still believing in this God that can deliver, but sometimes strangely chooses not to. After witnessing Jesus' death and resurrection, the rest of the apostles and others who followed in their steps of faith, one after the other, as they got to that junction where God makes no sense, bow their hearts and surrender their lives to God for good. Choosing to be killed and to live faithless. Why? Do you think these people just stumbled on that kind of faith? What did they know that others who succumbed at that same junction didn't? What set them apart from the rest? The truth. What truth? 
that God is God no matter what, that God is good no matter what he does or does not. How did they come to such deadly conclusion? They learned God from God, not from secondary sources. Despite how they came into the faith, they learned God, not from anyone or from life's experiences, because those can and will always misrepresent God. They learned God from their personal walk with him, and they chose what to believe, irrespective of what life serves or takes from them. That faith was their choice, and that choice was not made in ignorance or via second-hand knowledge. It was as intentional as it could prove detrimental. They learn that God can do all things, but it is his choice to do it or not to. That God does not have to do anything to prove that he's God. That God does not have to make us feel good to prove that he is good. These people chose before they got to that dangerous junction where God makes no sense. That with or without proof, God is good. God is God. Case closed. How do I know? Because that is a path I have walked many times and I'm sure many of us who are still stuck on this God are familiar with. Faith is no exemption from suffering. Every one of us at one time or the other will have to choose to believe or not. We will have to decide if God is worth loving simply for God's sake or not. We will have to determine if our love for God will be conditioned upon what he does for us or gives to us or unconditional irrespective of what he does gives or not that is the only time we can serve god from the heart whether he rewards or not we will keep praying whether he answers or not we will continue to do good no matter how life treats us our love for God is perfected when it is no longer hinged on his performance, but instead is anchored on his unfailing integrity as God. When I'm at that junction, when God makes no sense, I want no one preaching at me. I just need to step back and reflect until I can come to that conclusion that God is worth the love, worth the worship, worth the sacrifice of whatever is being squeezed out of me. But we have to make that choice before we get to that bridge or it will be even harder to make, which is why many fall off at that point. Every one of us, despite the route that brings us to God, have to reach that point where we don't need anyone to teach us God and his ways. We just learn him in our ways because that is how we can recognize him, irrespective of his performances or lack of it. Our love for God will be tried, purified, and made whole in the furnace of life's afflictions, not on the bed of luxury. And that is when we truly and wholly love God, simply because He is God. It doesn't matter what others think, say, or do. You know, and you are still in what you know, irrespective of what God does or not. That is where we can truly pray. Thy will be done, O God, from the heart and be okay with whatever God allows. Even though his answers bring us into pain, we maintain the faith through our tears because of what we know. If you would like to learn more about God's perspective on what we label disappointment and suffering, check out my books titled Unlimited Life and out of the ashes arise. They are great sources of inspiration and encouragement and they are available on Amazon. You can also find them on the links below. Whether we see it, feel it, know it or not, according to his word, God has our best interest at heart and works all things together for good to make them beautiful in the end. He will use the same edge that is destroying others to lead those who choose to keep believing higher, pull them closer and make us more like him. God has never failed. His faithfulness is proven through generations. God is worth loving and worth pursuing just for God's sake. And whichever way that pursuit takes us, 
may we always find the right answers to the question of why should I believe, especially when we are stuck at that junction where God makes no sense. Amen. Don't forget to subscribe and share this with family and friends. Be inspired. You are a star and it's your time to shine.